Well, my name is Patricia Moore, and I work at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Anybody visit Johnson Space Center or maybe, yeah, Kennedy Space Center? Uh, all right. So a few of you have been to some of our visitor center. Awesome. Well, we're really, gra gla bleh. <laughs> we're really glad to be here today. We've got a great panel for you. Um, before we get started, one housekeeping um, thing. If you could please silence your cell phones, you're more than welcome to take pictures and video, um, but we'd really appreciate it if you put it on vi uh, vibrate, please. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and kick it off and uh, get everybody excited with a great video showing you our brand new Space Launch System rocket and our Orion spacecraft um, showing the, our first mission together for Exploration Mission 1. Space Center in Florida at T minus three hours and holding. And we're now in the final five hours of the countdown. Crew going down the elevator has been used by the astronauts ever since Apollo. It's great to be in Florida today. The rocket is ready to go fly. Uh, the team is ready to go fly. New mission is quite a bit different than the shuttle mission. The next mission is to go beyond Earth. We're at T minus two hours, 38 minutes, six seconds and counting as the crew approaches the launch pad. Knowledge of the universe, but for the improvements you have contributed to on Earth. Have an excellent mission and Godspeed. Crew Denver, and work at this time. Right. Flight crew, OTC, close the mic advisors, and an engine, OTC, close. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. All engines are confirming. 1, 0, and lift off. Patricia, and I'm part of the communication team at NASA. We've got a great panel um, today that uh, engineers um, that are working on the Space Launch System rocket, the Orion spacecraft, that are going to help get humans uh, back to the moon and on to Mars. And we even have a special guest who has been to space herself. So let's get started introducing our panel. Um, let's kick it off with our first guest, Joe Cassidy. <laughs> Joe currently serves as the Executive Director of Space Programs in Washington, D.C. office for the Aerojet Rocketdyne, where he helps oversee strategy, development, and architecture for future space exploration and launch systems. It's a pretty big title, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but he's best known around D.C. as Mr. Mars, and if you don't believe me, you can take a look at his license plate. <laughs> so uh, please join in welcoming Aerojet Rocketdyne's very own Mr. Mars. <laughs> Our next guest is Howard Hugh. Come on, Howard. <laughs> Howard is the avionics power and software manager for the Orion spacecraft, which means he's responsible for Orion's 
power. <laughs> <laughs> and all the computers that control the spacecraft. When Howard is not busy perfecting computer and power systems on board Orion, he enjoys salsa dancing. Anybody like salsa dancing? Yeah, a few. <laughs> and he also acts as his family's Uber driver. Yeah. <laughs> All right, our next expert is Orion's very own parachute man, Jared Dom. <laughs> Jared is a parachute engineer for Orion, and he makes sure the Orion spacecraft and astronauts splash down safely in the ocean. And in Jared's free time, he likes traveling, photography, and playing sports. Yep. Thanks for joining us, Jared. Thank you. All right. And our fourth and final guest is astronaut Peggy Whitson. <laughs> Peggy was chosen to be an astronaut in 1996 and has finished three six-month missions to the International Space Station. She was named the first NASA science officer on her first mission and returned to the International Space Station as commander of her second mission. Over the course of her three missions to the space station, she's done hundreds of experiments, completed 10 spacewalks, and holds 665 days in space. That's a long time. She's placing eighth on the all-time space endurance list. And in her free time between all of her missions, she was chief of the astronaut corps. So, and, and then when she has lots of extra time, she likes gardening and doing um, fun things at her house. <laughs> All right, so please welcome and joining our panel. All right, well, welcome, everybody. It's a really exciting time for NASA right now. We are planning uh, missions to the moon, past the moon, and eventually on to Mars. But before we can send humans to Mars, we need to learn as much as we can about the planet. Um, you've all seen movies about Mars, right? Yeah, you read books maybe? Yeah, all right. So this is gonna be kind of interactive. I'm gonna ask you guys some questions so you can shout out some answers. So my course, first question for you is, how do we get all the information we know about Mars? We've never sent humans. Google. <laughs> Google, right? We get all of our info from Google. <laughs> all right, what else besides Google? <laughs> Somebody yell it out, come on. Curiosity, hey, rovers, yeah. very good. You guys are awesome. So everything we know, we know from our robotic explorers um, to Mars. We've got satellites, probes, landers, and um, rovers that have all shared lots of great information with us. All right, so with that information, it helps us understand about the planet and how we can prepare for missions to Mars. So let's kind of be mission planners right now. I need you guys to help me think, if we were sending a human mission to Mars right now, what types of supplies would we need to take with us? Water. Water, yeah, very, good. very good. What yeah. else? Air, food, what else? Water. Yeah, water. water. Yeah. Right. What about spacesuits? Do we need spacesuits? Yeah. Helmets. Helmets, yeah. There are a lot of great types. Scientists. Scientists, very good. We're going to need lots of supplies for a mission to Mars. And there are a lot of challenges when it comes to planning a mission. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about those challenges right now and what NASA is doing to help us prepare for these missions. So let's start with one of the biggest challenges. The biggest <coughs> challenge is keeping our astronauts strong and healthy, right? We want our astronauts to be able yeah. to have a yep. successful mission. And Peggy knows a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. She's lived on the space station quite a long time. So why don't you share with us your experiences and how we keep our astronauts strong? Sure. Well, exercise is extremely important for us. And if you think about it, when you don't have gravity pulling down on your body, it becomes really important because your muscles forget how to work and so they, they atrophy, they shrink, and your bone, even your bone will actually atrophy in a way, it's called de demineralization. And it's like if your grandmother had maybe osteoporosis, she would lose 1% of her bone density in a year. And in, as an astronaut, we would lose 1% uh, of our bone density in a month. So we have to do a lot of exercise to try and counteract that. And this exercise device behind us, shown in the video, is the advanced resistive exercise device. It's basically like weightlifting, but because you're in space, it does, the weights don't weigh anything, so you have to work against resistance. Uh, it's a really great piece of hardware. It's very flexible and adaptable, can do lots of different exercises. And it's got the isolation system to protect the experiments. So it, it moves instead of uh, inducing the vibrations into the structure. 
We also have a treadmill with a harness that holds us down to the treadmill and makes us feel like we're back on Earth and you have to work against the force of that harness. Uh, and we have a bicycle ergometer. So two and a half hours of exercise a day uh, in order to, to really get keep from losing that bone and muscle. Well, I bet all of that exercise makes Peggy really hungry, huh? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> Can so, you imagine? <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about the types of food that you eat in space? We've got prepackaged food for the most part. We do get some fresh food occasionally on some of the cargo vehicles that come up, like fresh oranges or tomatoes. Uh, but most of it's prepackaged and has to have a long shelf life because we have to send it up maybe a year in advance uh, on board the space station. We have uh, some fun things that we do. I made up some jello for Christmas. And you can see that uh, eating, eating food in space is a little bit different. You can have a lot more fun playing with it. Um, <laughs> so it, it's pretty neat to be able to, to le learn how to work and live in uh, microgravity. We do have the f a few items of fresh food. We were, we're trying out new growth systems for onboard the space station, so I was able to grow some uh, cabbage and lettuce on board the space station. Every other harvest was uh, for science, so we'd have to freeze it back, but the ones in between, we would get to eat it, and it was really good because everything else comes in these packages. Yeah, so you mentioned you get food, so we have send resupply ships to the space station often, which makes it easier for the astronauts to get supplies. But when we go to the moon and on to Mars, it's going to be a little bit harder. So yeah. how are we going to pack, or what types of foods would we have for long, deep space missions? Well, for those missions, they're going to have to be really shelf-stable for long periods of time, and it might not be very interesting food. I don't know. <laughs> but we've got this incredible team at the food laboratory at the Johnson Space Center that's working on coming up with new ideas where it's going to be food with high, high caloric intake, which means it's got lots of energy and you don't have to, it doesn't take up as much space or mass. So that's going to be important to us uh, for the future. Awesome. Well, we have uh, some folks in the food lab who put together a really great video for you to kind of show you some of the work that they're doing with new types of foods to use when we go to the moon and Mars. So let's take a look. Hi, my name is Jessica Voss, and I'm an engineer here at Johnson Space Center for the Orion Vehicle. And my name is Takia Sermons. I'm a food scientist here in the Space Food Systems Laboratory. We're here today because Orion's Exploration Mission 2 mission has us going around the moon without being attached to any sort of habitation module. So in order to complete that mission, we need to pack all the food that we need for four crew for like 10 to 14 days. So that's quite a bit of mass and volume that we're talking about. So I've tasked the Space Food Systems Laboratory to help me out with this. And so these are just a few of the meal replacement bars that we have scheduled to go on the Orion vehicle. We have the banana nut bar, orange cranberry bar, ginger vanilla bar, and barbecue nut bar, each totaling about 700 to 800 calories. So it's a, a huge meal replacement, and Jessica is going to taste those here with us today. So we have some human studies going on that'll tell us whether or not people could eat bars every day, or if they need to eat them every five days, or every seven days, or they don't like bars at all. So. All right. Well, I'm excited to see how that study turns out, and in the meantime... <laughs> Does that look yummy? Yeah. <laughs> Would you want to eat it every day? <laughs> yeah. Three that, times a day. <laughs> that's why it's called supplement. Yeah. This one. This one looks like spam. <laughs> Is it like a peanut butter version? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, since we're all now space food experts, right? Yeah. All right. We're going to play a little game called What's for Lunch? Anybody hungry? Yeah, all right, it's new. I mean, somebody should be hungry. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take maybe, let's see, one, two, three, four volunteers, four of our little volunteers to come on up, and we're going to play a little food game, okay? So when you come up, come down to that end where the stairs are so you can come up stage. All right, so why don't you pick two people from the back, and I'll pick two from the front. All right, we're going to go with this young lady right here and this young man. Come on. How are you doing today? Good. All right. Hello there. All right. Oh, that's the hard one. Don't peek at it like that. Like you can hold it like this, but don't look at the writing because that's cheating. 
<laughs> Here's one. Don't turn it over. It's got writing on the other side. Just without looking. Just look at this and see what you might so guess that is. You think so? All right. So uh, what they're going to do is Does they're going to take a look at their food, and they're going to try to guess what it is, and then we're going to flip it over, and Peggy's going to help them tell everybody what type of food they have in their hands. What do you think this might be? If you added water to that, what would that be? It's pretty bland looking, isn't it? I think so, too. Mm -hmm. Let's read it. It says it's cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, yours looks pretty similar to hers. What do you think it is? What do you think it might be? The same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Here, let's look on this side because it's got... What do you think that is? It looks like a raisin, that or dirt, right? <laughs> it's oatmeal with raisins and spice. That one's actually pretty yummy. <laughs> what do you think this one is? A banana? It's a bar for sure. It happens to be a yogurt covered one, I think. Oh. Yeah, yogurt covered granola bar. That's pretty good too. <laughs> what do you think yours is? Without peeking. What does it feel like? It's like slime. Yeah, well, yogurt's a good idea. We get yogurt in packages just like this. But this one is. Mixed vegetables. <laughs> I, think it's been, I think it's been squished by a few kids over the years. <laughs> but it's actually good, too. This awesome. one's good, too. All so. right. Well, thanks, guys. Great job. <laughs> okay. Good job. Thank you guys for coming up. <laughs> now you're all really hungry for that cream and mushroom soup, aren't you? <laughs> and the slime. <laughs> and the slime. <laughs> and the slime. <laughs> awesome. All right, so when you guys have a great family dinner, do you sit in silence? No, no you talk, right? So with great food comes good conversations. Our astronauts have great conversations um, on the space station, and they will when they go to Mars. But there's going to be times where they want to connect back to NASA, back to their families, and a communication gets more difficult as we go farther and farther away from Earth. So, um, Howard, why don't you tell us a little bit about how astronauts communicate on the station and what our plans are for Mars? Great. Uh, yeah, so obviously communication is always a challenge if you get further away. Um, we're planning a mission to Mars, and so we're going to do that in steps. So if you know today, like Peggy was on the International Space Station, it's 250 miles above us. It's a great platform for us to do a lot of testing and understanding of how we live in space. Um, and of course, communication there is very easy. It's, it's instant. Uh, you can call down, and we talk to the astronauts uh, on a daily basis and sometimes on an hourly basis as well. So we have a lot of communication. And certainly if there's an issue on space station, they need to come home. You know, they can get on the spaceship and then uh, come home about three hours. So they'll, they'll land safely and, and, and be able to come home. Now, when we go a little bit further out, you know, step two, when we go and do a, a lunar type of mission and go out to the moon, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of miles away. And so that communication is going to have a little bit more lag but certainly a great platform also for us to do a lot of testing and understanding of technologies uh, on that lunar platform. But now the challenge will be coming home. So if there's any issues, it's going to take several days to come home. So certainly you could talk and uh, have that communication quickly, but you're going to have a harder time uh, returning. And then when we're ready to go to Mars, uh, that's going to be our biggest challenge. That's millions of miles away. And so we're going to really have to uh, help ourselves in terms of understanding and building systems that help us communicate. And then that's going to be a long uh, journey, not only seven to eight months uh, uh, out, on an outbound mission, but uh, we're going to spend six months on the surface and another seven to eight months coming back. And then, of course, the communication is going to be a big challenge because it's going to be like 12 and a half minutes one way to send a message to Mars and then another 12 and a half minutes to come back. So that's like 25 minutes total that you're going to have to wait for a response. And so I think there's uh, something coming up that we could demonstrate. Yeah. yeah, so that's a really long time to wait for an answer. And what if you were waiting for a really, really important response? Maybe something a little like this. Suppose this boy on Earth was asking this girl on Mars to go out on a date. Just work with me here a second. First, he asks a question. Uh, will you go out with me? On average, Mars is about 225 million kilometers from Earth. 
the speed of the signal carrying the message is the speed of light, or 300,000 kilometers a second. At that speed, with a straight shot, the message will take about 12 and a half minutes to make it to the girl. Uh, where you go out with me? The girl answers, and her signal, again traveling the speed of light, must make the roughly 225 million kilometer journey back to Earth. All said and done, our Romeo here can expect about a 25 minute wait to get his answer. Yes, I'll go out with you, but I won't be back on Earth until next year. So all joking aside, the communication delay is really important. And uh, how are we kind of practicing or working to kind of prepare for that here at NASA? Yeah, so uh, certainly we want to make sure we understand how that uh, lag works. And so we do a lot of simulations at NASA. Uh, and these simulations allow us to, to uh, practice for these missions. And so we'll put in these lags and, and uh, put it in our simulations and practice uh, that kind of level of communication. Well, speaking of practice, we do a lot of testing at NASA, not just with communication, but in other areas. And we had a really amazing practice or test launch of Orion a few years ago, and we have another big test coming up soon. That's right. That's right. So I'm wearing a patch called the Exploration Flight uh, 1, EFT-1. Uh, this is back in December 2014. We had a very successful flight where we test tested out Orion systems. And in two years, we're going to have another great flight called Exploration Mission 1, and we're going to be launching on the Space Launch System, the most powerful rocket we've ever built. All right. Well, Joe, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about what to expect from Exploration Mission 1. Yeah, sure. Let me jump up here so I can see what we got going. That is the SLS. We're going to launch out of Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We'll go into orbit around the Earth, do one lap around the Earth, check out the systems, and we put the upper stage engine, we burn it again, and that's going to put us on a long trajectory out to the moon, take us about six to eight days. We go into an orbit around the moon that's actually going to take us 40,000 miles beyond the moon, so it's further than we've ever been before. We stay in that orbit for about another week or so, then we burn the upper or we burn the engine on the Orion service module. That puts us. I'm going to have to let it loop twice. I just can't talk fast <laughs> enough to keep up. The SLS is so powerful, and Orion gets going so fast that I get behind. So here we are out at the moon. There's the orbit around the moon. Now we're going to burn that Ohm's engine on the service module. Now we're coming back to Earth. We actually hit the atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour, faster than we've ever come in before. So you're going to hear about the heat shield later on. It's really important. That's going to slow us down to about 300 miles an hour. That's when the parachutes take over. They bring us down to about a gentle 20 miles an hour, and we touch down in the Pacific Ocean. Wow, that's exciting, isn't it? All right. Well, just listening to you talk, I heard a few things that if I were an astronaut like Peggy, I would want to make sure uh, the systems worked really well. So first of all, if I'm on a rocket, you want to make sure the rocket's safe, right? Yeah. All right, and then once you get into space, you're going to experience more radiation than you would here on Earth. So I would want to be protected, wouldn't you? Yeah. All right. And then when you come home, you have to enter the atmosphere. He talked about 5,000 degrees that your spacecraft will experience. And then you have to slow down enough from the parachutes to splash down. So these are all really big challenges that our team's working on right now. So we're going to get started with the first, with the rocket. So Joe, you and your team work really hard to make sure the rocket's safe for astronauts like Peggy. So tell us a little bit about the, our engines. Sure. So um, one of the things that we're doing with SLS, and this is the SLS here, so this, this big orange piece is the core section. The engines on that are actually engines that we used on the space shuttle program. They're called RS-25. We've been testing them. We've tested the first four for that EM-1 mission. They're all ready to go. Um, we're testing more now for the EM-2 mission, and we're actually pushing that engine harder. Just this past week, we tested one to 113%. So we went way past where we'd ever run it before. The solid rocket boosters on the side here are also from the shuttle program. We added one more segment to get a little more out of them, and those burn right on liftoff and give us a lot more thrust to get off the ground. And then the other part that we're working on is up here on top, the launch abort system. And that's actually really important for the astronauts on launch and on their way up into orbit because at any point in that, if there's a bad problem on the rocket, that will fire and it will pull the capsule away and keep the astronauts and the crew safe. They can just parachute down and land in the ocean. Wow, that's awesome. So yeah. how big is SLS going to be once it's all put together? So that from the bottom to the top, it, we're in New York, right? So how many of you know, how many, you've been over the Statue of Liberty? Hands, show of hands. How many people have been to the Statue of Liberty? Okay, so you guys know kind of how tall that is, about 305 feet tall. 
This is 17 feet taller than that, so about 322 feet. Wow. So how powerful is it going to be? All right. Okay. Another question for the audience. How many of you out there have ever flown on an airplane? Show of hands. Okay. So you know what airplanes are like. You know what a 747 is? Big airplane, right? Big four engines. Okay. About 139 747s wow. is what we have, about 8 million pounds of thrust that lift off with the SLS. That's a lot. And I bet you can carry a lot with that amount of thrust. Yeah, you know, we need a lot to go up there to get into that lunar orbit, uh, to get the crew and the Orion out there. So the original um, SLS that we're going to fly on EM-1, it's good for about 150 or so thousand pounds which we like to put in terms that people can understand. So that's about 12 fully grown elephants. <laughs> and <laughs> later on, when we go to Mars, we're actually going to need even more stuff because we want to take rovers like you guys were talking about and habitats for the astronauts to live in. Howard says we're going to be there for six months. You got to have a place to live. You got to want you want a car to drive around and stuff like that. We want to explore and do really good science. So all that stuff we got to take up. We're going to have an even bigger version, and it's going to hold, it, it could launch 22 elephants into space. So, But we're not really taking elephants. No, no, we're oh, really okay. not going to take elephants. Right. That's just our that's just our analogy that okay. we use. All right, just Something sure. big and heavy. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are lots of different rockets out there right now. So what makes yeah. the Space Launch System different? So right now, there's, you know, we talked about the space stations about 200 miles up, and there's a lot of rockets that can go up to what we call low Earth orbit. And we can take supplies up, we can launch satellites, we can do all that stuff. But the SLS is designed to go to deep space. So you saw the Exploration Mission 1. We're going to go out there. We're going to go around the moon. We're going to go beyond, go on out to Mars. We can do even robotic missions like Europa. Anyone's ever heard of the Europa Clipper mission here? We could actually cut the time in half to get to Europa if we use the SLS. So it's truly a deep space rocket. And that's what's making it different than, than all the other yeah. ones that we have today. So who's excited to see this baby launch? Yeah, who's going to go to Kennedy Space Center and watch in person? Who's going to watch on TV? You better all raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> who's going to watch on Twitch? You huh? do? That's awesome. So the space launch system is just the, the really beginning part of the mission. And now, once we get our astronauts into space, um, astronauts are going to experience more radiation than they would here on Earth. So um, if you were somebody like one of these guys and like Peggy here on the stage, if you had to figure out how to maybe keep astronauts safe from radiation, what are some ideas you might have? Any? Very thick covers, great idea. What about you? Very strong covers. Yeah, you're going to need something to protect them, right? So, Howard, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, why deep space radiation is, is a little bit more challenging than what we would experience here on Earth? Yeah, certainly that's another big challenge for us. You know, radiation is, is something that we have to protect astronauts against, and we're always looking at ways to do that and trying to improve that as we uh, uh, go beyond Earth and uh, go to the moon and Mars. Yeah, so we've got great teams at NASA that specialize in how to protect our astronauts. And, and we're going to take a look at a video to see what we're going to do to protect our astronauts from a solar flare while they're on Orion. Whew. Holy moly. All right. Hi, my name is Jessica Voss, and this is Ann McLean. And we are here today helping the designers of the Orion capsule evaluate the ability to protect their crew from radiation. Radiation, as you know, is really harmful. And so the whole point is for us to get into a really cool little shelter and take all the equipment we have in this, in this capsule and put it over us as best as possible. And we have to make sure it's stowed and that we are safe and we have everything we need in terms of supplies down in this awesome little bay. Yeah, going to space is hard and going to deep space is harder. And uh, the technologies that we're gonna need to successfully get to Mars uh, have been being developed for many years, and it's going to take many tests like this one over many years by a large group of people in order to make that mission successful in the 2030s. So we're excited to get there, and we're working every day toward uh, toward that goal. All right, so if there's a solar flare, the astronauts kind of just jump in a cubby and make a space fort, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they may well make sure they have food and water, and of course something monitor, make sure they're safe while they're in their fort. Awesome. All right. So we've gotten through two of our challenges, right? We've gotten through the rocket launch. We've gotten through space radiation. So now we're coming home. And what do you think is going to happen when we hit the Earth's atmosphere? Scream it out. Friction. friction. And when you get friction, it gets really hot. 
right. That's yeah. right. And it's going to get up to about 5,000 degrees. So, Jared, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we're going to protect our astronauts from that 5,000 degree temperature? Sure thing. So, I'll grab a couple um, visual aids here. So, um, you've all ridden in a car before, right? Yeah, so if you're driving down the road at about 30 miles an hour, you can stick your hand out the window, and you can feel the, air, the cool air rushing over your hand. Um, it doesn't get too hot because you're only going about 30 miles an hour. But as Joe mentioned, when we come back from the moon or Mars, we're going to be going about 25,000 miles per hour. It's going to be so hot that that friction with the air, like, like one of these kids just said, the friction is going to heat the um, capsule up to over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's really, really hot. So we have a couple, couple ways we keep our crew nice and safe. Um, so there's two uh, thermal protection systems. Thanks, Howard. Um, on the back shell here, so this kind of slanted part, we have tiles just like Howard's holding. So this is very similar to what we have on the space shuttle, the space shuttle tiles. And they insulate the crew on the inside from these really hot temperatures on the outside. Uh, now on the front of Orion, we call this the heat shield. Um, this is a different type of, of thermal protection system. We call it an ablative thermal protection system. So as Orion's coming in, we're heating up to about 5,000 degrees, pieces of this heat shield are going to shed away to dissipate some of that energy. Um, so those two systems combined are very important to uh, keep our, our astronauts in a nice, comfy, about 70 degrees on the inside while it's hot as lava you know, on the outside. Whoa. That's yeah. pretty hot. So I'll ask you guys the next question. Once we begin to re-enter, what happens after the heat shield does its job? <coughs> what do, what do, how are we going to slow down the rest of the way? Parachutes. parachutes. We got a parachute guy right there. So why yep. don't you tell us about how the parachutes are going to help us slow down and land safely in the ocean? Sure thing. So like Patricia mentioned, I'm a parachute engineer at Johnson Space Center, and I design and develop the 11 parachutes that we have on Orion to bring our astronauts home to Earth from the moon or Mars. Um, so we do have a, a sample chute here. Uh, I think, can we get yeah, some, some help? Yeah, we're going to need four volunteers. So if we could do two from the back again, and we'll do two from the front, and try to choose bigger children for this one. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is not a light parachute. You two girls right there on the end. Come on. So like I mentioned, Orion has 11 parachutes in total, and they have to work together as a team to slow us down um, at about 25,000 feet at about 350 miles an hour down to a nice 17 or 20 miles per hour so that our astronauts splash down nice and safe in the ocean. Yeah, come on over here. So this is identical to one of the 11 that you'll see on the Exploration Mission 1 that Joe talked about. So um, when you guys see uh, Orion coming back from the moon next year, you can tell all your friends you touched one of those parachutes that brought him back. So this is one of our mid-sized chutes. We call this a drogue parachute. So this is a very strong parachute. It's about 23 feet in diameter. There you go. Good job. So about 20, 23 feet in diameter, that gives us about 400 square feet of what we call drag area. Um, I mentioned this is a medium-sized parachute. At 400 square feet, this is small compared to our three large main parachutes. Each one of those is 11,000 square feet. So each one of our main parachutes could cover four or five houses. Stretched end to end, they would cover uh, the length of an entire football field. So we're talking some serious area in order to slow down our 20,000-pound Orion spacecraft for a nice 17-mile-per-hour landing in the ocean. You guys feel that? What, does that material feel familiar? Yeah. yeah? What, what have you felt that feels like that? You said ribbon. Sort of like a silk ribbon? Over here. Like silk over here? Yeah. So this is nylon. So this white and red, um, this is a material called nylon. It's very similar to what you would make a tent out of or a backpack or maybe if you've been wearing a jacket out here in the, in the cold New York uh, wind. Why is it in strips? Excellent question. So this is what we call a ribbon parachute. These look like ribbons like you just mentioned. So um, you're well on your way to being a parachute expert. Um, so these ribbon parachutes have these holes all over them. And these holes um, give what we call geometric porosity. They add stability to the parachute. They help the parachute stay right behind the Orion spacecraft as we're falling down towards the ocean. Good job, guys. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. One more really interesting fact while they're taking their seats. Eight of our 11 parachutes are mortar deployed. Um, so this drogue parachute will pack into a bag about the size of a large backpack, stuff it into a cannon, and pyrotechnically mortar it out into the airstream, big fireball, um, to allow it to inflate. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's Orion's awesome. packed with cannons on top. That is awesome. All right. So aren't you glad we have folks like these gentlemen to help astronauts like Peggy get to space and come home safely? Yeah. yeah. Now, Peggy, why don't you tell us when our first crew will fly on the SLS and Orion? 
Well, you heard them, uh, Hugh talk earlier about uh, the fact that we're going to have a mission that's going to test all our systems again, and the exploration one in a couple of years, 2019. And then after that, two years, about two years after that, we're going to have our first crewed mission. And we've got to do a lot of testing for the life support systems in order to do that very well. One of the really things I think is really cool that we're testing on board the International Space Station is our water reclamation system. You know, uh, several young people said we got to take a lot of water to go to Mars or the moon, and we need to be able to recycle as much water as we can. So even the breath that we breathe out, we, we collect that and recycle that, and, and our sweat, you know, the, from the air, it gets collected and recycled. But the biggest component is recycling our urine. And we're doing that on board the International Space Station now. And it actually sounds, I know it sounds bad, but it really is a good thing. And it's going to enable us to go to Mars with much less water than what we originally thought we'd have to take. So that's good news for us. But all these life support systems have to be tested out, and then we'll put humans on it on that flight. Awesome. And we're going to have several other exploration missions as we build up a presence around the moon. So do you want to talk a little bit about what's, what's coming? Well, there's, there's just going to be lots of <laughs> lots. different aspects. So we're going to have around the moon, we are going to have potentially a gateway. Uh, that, then this could be kind of a fuel station for future missions. It can also be a, a waypoint for us to go down and do surface explorations on the moon and then come back to. And it's going to give us the capability to learn a lot more about how to live and work in deep space, because we're doing that right now in close to the atmosphere, close to Earth now on the International Space Station, but we've got to get take it one step further. Awesome. So we potentially could have a Martian astronaut in this audience. So how oh. old do you think that individual might be? I'd be guessing about middle school. Anybody, Anybody in middle school? Any mini schoolers? Oh, See, yeah. we could. You guys would be potential astronauts in the future. So, I think it's really, really important right now that you get out there and you're studying your math and science, all the engineering things. It's it, it's going to be a really fun experiment. Not only going there, but just designing the things that we're going to need to get us there. Yeah. All right. So you guys want to be a part of our journey to Mars? Help us go on to the moon and on to Mars, yeah? All right, well, there's going to be a lot of amazing things happening at NASA from now until then, and you can keep up with what's going on by following us on social media, or you can go to nasa.gov. We've got lots of great <coughs> stories and pictures and videos, um, and uh, Peg, like Peggy and the astronauts, they all have Twitter and Facebook, so you can kind of follow along with their missions as well. So we've got a good amount of time, about 20 minutes until we're, we have to clear the auditorium. And this is the time where you get to ask your questions to our panel. So if you have a question, we'll do um, three from the bottom and then go th a couple from the top. So you have to say it really big so I can hear you. And then I'm going to repeat so everyone knows what you asked. Let's start on this side, this gentleman right here. How strong is the radiation we experience on Earth? So on Earth, we're actually protected a lot by the, uh, the atmosphere, but primarily by what's called the geomagnetosphere. So because our Earth is magnetized, has poles, uh, that, that magnetosphere is what actually protects us from most of that space radiation. So when we go into space on the International Space Station, we're kind of at the edge of that magnetosphere. So we're still pretty protected. It's more radiation than we get here on the ground. Uh, but up there, it's a little bit more. When we go out to Moon and Mars, we're going to have no, essentially very little protection. And so we want to get there as fast as we can. And when we get there, we want to build our habitats in such a way, maybe underground, maybe, so we're being protected from that radiation. Because they neither the Mars or Moon has a magnetosphere to protect us. That's a good question. All right, this young lady right there at the very end of the row. Yes, you. So the question is, why is there gravity on Earth, but no gravity in space? Who, who wants that one? OK. <laughs> I'll take a shot. Um, there's a couple of things going on. One is, when you're on the space station, you're going really fast. You're going 17,500 miles an hour. And essentially, 
you're just kind of falling around the edge of the earth. You know, if you shoot a cannon, the, the cannonball goes up and then it comes back down. Well, we shoot it faster and faster until we just keep going around and we keep falling, but we never fall back down to earth. So you're kind of essentially in free fall in the space station. Now, when we go way out into space and we get really far away, if you do your math and you're studying about gravity, you'll see it depends on um, the radius. It's a one over R type of thing. So the further out you go, the further away from the body that has the mass, then the lower, lower down that, that gravitational attraction is. It's not as strong. And then that's also true when you go to a place like the moon, which is smaller than the Earth, then the gravity on the moon is only like one-sixth of the Earth because it doesn't have as much mass. And when you go to Mars, it's only one-third because, again, it doesn't have quite as much mass as the Earth. Good question. All right, this young man right here. What's the trigger to open the parachute? Excellent question. So the parachute system is triggered based on the flight software. So Orion has a very complex guidance, navigation, and control system that monitors the attitude, actually how the vehicle is pointing, the altitude, um, the velocity. Yep, so show me some attitudes. So. Not your attitude, <laughs> attitudes of Orion. <laughs> this is a good attitude. That is a great that's attitude the, for coming in. That's the best joke of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that was unscripted too, that's yeah, good. <laughs> that's a bad attitude, no. no bad attitude. So the, the Orion flight software system uses RCS reaction control system thrusters all around the vehicle to keep the good end, the heat shield, pointed down. Now, once our guidance and navigation and control system detects that we're at about 25,000 feet, we start firing our mortars to get our parachutes out. Um, we ride our parachutes, for instance, this drogue parachute, we'll ride it down to about 6,000 feet in altitude, at which point the guidance, navigation, and control system will see that we're at 6,000 feet and trigger the release of our drogues and the deployment of our main parachutes. So it's all automated. It is all automated. Ah, yep. Very awesome. All right, we've got a couple from the back. You have to talk really big so we can hear you. <laughs> our five years old. Too oh, our five year olds too, allowed too to, to are too yes. young to work at NASA. So yes. when you answer that, maybe tell them about how old they can be when they work at NASA. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll take that All one. Right. I, I think uh, we want everybody to work at NASA. I think you got a little bit of ways to go in terms of getting math and science, like Peggy was talking about, relative to studying and getting some basic education. And so that's very important for our jobs. And so usually, you know, you have to go through high school and, a, and get a college degree in one of the sciences or engineering or math. Those are the areas where we take on NASA uh, from a design perspective. But certainly we, and you saw earlier, food sciences and other areas uh, that we, we help with the mission. So there's a lot of other degrees and uh, educational uh, backgrounds that we uh, help our NASA mission as well. So certainly uh, there's a very big diverse pool of uh, people that work at NASA. Yeah. And, and while you're going through that journey, that journey that Howard mentioned going through high school, getting your um, college degree in one of these cool fields, I think one of the most important things you can do in your development is to get what we call an internship. Um, you can do an internship at NASA, you can do an internship at, at any company really, and it really gives you the real world, world experience of what it's like to be an engineer or a doctor or a budget analyst um, so that you can see what's important in school and, uh, and how you actually like that field um, as it's applied in the real world. Awesome. Anybody interested in an internship at NASA or with another aerospace company? Yeah. Some hands? Yeah. All right. All right. Let's do another one from the back, please. Why is the... Oh, go ahead. Why is the earth blue and green? Ah, well, the earth is actually lots and lots of different colors. But when you see the pictures from high above, you're seeing, looking mostly at the ocean, and you'll see lots of the blues of the ocean. The Caribbean is incredible because mm -hmm. it's got all different shades of blue-green, and it's, it's incredibly beautiful, uh, just like it is on Earth. Uh, you can see land masses, and they'll have different colors, and it'll be based on what, what you're looking at. If it's mountains, you know, it can be any range of browns and grays and blacks. Uh, uh, sands can be red, dirt can, oh, cool. soil can be very red, like Australia looks very red from space. So there's all different colors that you can see from space. Um, and it, it's just really beautiful, beautiful place that we live on, incredible spaceships. Awesome. All right, we're going to come back down to the front. Yes, yes, ma'am. 
So, good question. So, how do we select astronauts um, for crews and for missions? So, usually the the chief of the astronaut office, which I did for a little while, uh, gets to pick the astronauts. And what we do for especially for international missions is we're trying to pick a crew that's going to work well together that has all the right skill sets, the robotic skills, the EVA skills. And obviously, the most important skill for uh, astronauts is uh, how, playing well with others. You have to really be able to get along well, be part of a team, and recognize uh, how to best uh, accomplish the mission and the goals. So teamwork is extremely important. All right. We're going to go right here to the middle in the front. So her question is for Peggy, and Peggy, how did you become interested in becoming an astronaut? Well, when I was nine years old, how old are you? Uh, six. Okay, when I was nine years old, I saw the first astronauts walk on the moon, and I thought, wow, cool job. And uh, when I graduated from high school was the year they picked the first female astronaut, and I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So it, it became a goal instead of a dream. I, and I did everything I could to pursue that goal. So I, I went and got my, my bachelor's degree, and then I went and got a PhD, and then I started working for NASA. And uh, I, I had to work at NASA for 10 years before I was lucky enough to get selected to be an astronaut. But that's how I, I got to be an astronaut. It was just from when I was a kid and watching somebody that inspired me. Great. All right. This, oh, we'll do a, a grown-up again. Go ahead. So, so the question is, um, while astronauts are in space, is there a doctor in space to help take care of them? We do have astronauts that have medical degrees, but all of us are trained as crew medical officers. So we actually do... Uh, EMT type training, uh, going to hospitals, uh, watching surgeries, and uh, working in emergency rooms, and going on ambulance rides, uh, just to kind of get a flavor and a feel for you know what we could do in an emergency. Obviously, in low Earth orbit, we can call the ground and ask them to talk us through uh, certain procedures or situations, uh, so we have that kind of as a backup. For future missions, again, we're going to have to be, you know, relying a little bit more on ourselves and data that we have on board for how we could solve the problems. All right, we're going to do two more from down here, and we'll go up. So our first one is from the young lady with the blonde hair, and then you're next, okay? All right. We can't hear you. Can you say it a little louder? So the question is, if you have a pet, are you allowed to bring it to space? <laughs> well, we, we don't actually take pets to space, but we do take animals up to try and better understand how uh, zero gravity affects uh, not only the animals, but uh, us in many cases. So we do research with some animals. We've had earthworms and ants and Butterfly. spiders Butterfly. and mice and Butterfly. fruit flies. <laughs> so we've had lots of different types of animals there. Um, and it takes some time for them to adapt to zero gravity, just like us. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's interesting to watch that process and better understand what's happening. If you Google, we were talking about Google earlier. If you Google um, butterflies in space or spiders in space, there are videos of them learning how to move around in space, build webs, and so it's pretty cool. So something you can search when you when you leave. All right, go ahead. So his question is, how long will it take until we're able to colonize Mars? You want that one? I'll, I'll take a, right. a cut, and then everybody can jump in. Um, right now, we're on a path that would get us to Mars in the 2030s for the first exploration missions. And so we're going to go, and um, I think one of the things we're really looking at seriously is building up capability over a series of missions to where we've got power, and the ability to move around and um, you know, ability to drill down to find things like water. 
and we'll build that capability up over maybe a decade or two. And then so, so that puts us out to about 2050. And then beyond that, depending on what we learn, I think then we could start really seriously looking at can we use some of the resources that we find there to help us kind of live off the land? And if that's the case, then you could start thinking about putting more people out there because you're not having to take everything you need with you every time. Yeah, great question. All right, let's do one from the back. Anybody? No, nobody from the back? Okay, then we'll do, we'll do you first and then the young man behind you next, okay? Oh, the question is, what if the parachutes aren't ready um, to, to yep. deploy when they're supposed to? Well, I, so I think the first part of the question is, what if the rocket runs out of fuel? Oh, okay. Joe, you want to take yeah. that? So one of the things we do with all these tests is we make sure that it doesn't do that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, if you're talking about when we're taking off, then that would be one of the situations where we would use the launch abort system. And it's its own little rocket with solid rocket propellant, and it just lifts the capsule off gets it up way high enough so that the parachutes can open up and come back down safe and sound. So then the question of what happens if the parachutes aren't ready, uh, to quote Joe, we work really hard to make sure it doesn't do that. Yeah. Um, so we do a lot of testing with these parachutes in all different scenarios, whether it's like Joe just mentioned, an abort where the launch abort system just took the, the crew and the module off either on the pad or during ascent, or any uh, uh, type of off nominal re-entry. We test all those. We have redundancy built into our parachute. So I mentioned we have 11 parachutes and they come out in four different stages. We could lose one parachute from each or every one of those four stages and still safely land the crew on the ground. So it's a lot of redundancy, a lot of hard work and testing to make sure that we're ready for any off nominal, any weird situation that might happen. Because you only have one shot at it. It's not like you get a flat mm -hmm. tire in your car and you can pull over and change your flat tire. If you lose a parachute, that parachute's gone. So we designed that redundant, redundancy into the system um, for Good. the safety of the crew. All and right. we have a fuel gauge, too. Um, yeah. <laughs> fuel gauge. <laughs> so you can refuel. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no. All right, so you're next. What's the heat shield made of? Yeah, yeah maybe I'll take that. Uh, so it's, it's called Abco, and it's the same material that was, uh, was developed in the Apollo program when we first went to the moon. And it's a, I, I can't even describe what the chemis, chemistry of that is, but it's a, it's a, it's a material that's made by a company uh, that invented it, and so it's called Avcoat. And remember he said it, it's ablative, it's, so you maybe explain. Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. ablative. So like um, we were talking about earlier, you know, on the, on the heat shield side, right here, this material, the Avcoat, uh, ablates away as the heat uh, burns through it, and it allows it to protect, and it's a very uh, strong material, but lightweight, and it allows us to keep the crew safe and and uh, in a comfortable position while they're inside the capsule. So it's basically burning off yeah. as it's coming in, and then we don't need that anymore. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, you have one right there? Okay. How do the decouplers work? I don't know what that is, so I don't... <laughs> Oh, to, to like stage, to, to when okay. the staging goes. Oh, okay. There's a couple different ways we do it. One of them involves, um, and this is the one that I think most of the systems use, it's just kind of like a, a band around, and um, there's pyrotechnics again. So when the signal comes, you know there's no more thrust out of that. It does run out of gas at some point. There's no more thrust coming out of that stage. Then the signal comes, it zips that thing off, just kind of like... Um, a little, uh, a little uh, controlled explosion that goes around and just cuts that, and then that first stage falls away, and then there's little rockets on the second stage that push it away to keep it from recontacting, and then the second stage engine lights up. Cool. All right. Right. Do do the rovers live in Mars? Is that? They Are there robots on Mars? Yeah. yeah, Mars is the only planet that we know that's only inhabited by robots <laughs> <laughs> right now, as far as we know. All right, anyone from the back? I'm giving you a chance. No? All right, so in the blue shirt, yes. How 
so her question is, is um, what, what did Peggy notice of her body changing when she was in space? Well, we, we, there are significant changes. When you first get into space, all the fluid goes to your head and you feel pretty uncomfortable, like, you, you know, you're, like you're standing on your head on the ground is what it feels like. And it takes a few days for your body to readjust and redistribute those fluids. Uh, some of it you pee out and some of it is actually just redistributed. But you actually end up losing 20% of your plasma volume. It's, so it's pretty significant when you come home. That's hard to compensate for, even though one of the first things we do is take plasma or IV fluids uh, to, to try and compensate for that. So there's changes in the eye. I talked about the bone and the muscle of changes. Uh, we have unknown effects on maybe the cardiovascular system. It, you know, we might be more susceptible later in age to those risks. Then there's also changes due to radiation uh, that we don't really understand yet. So there's lots of things that are going on. From a just physical perspective, that first feeling is probably the most overwhelming in terms of, you know, having a big sensation of your change in your physical body. All right, thanks. We're going to take one from the back. So what is, role, uh, what is SpaceX's role with NASA? Um, well, I think it's a little different. I think we have different types of missions. Uh, SpaceX and other providers like uh, Boeing and Sierra Nevada are really taking over a role for NASA in terms of transporting uh, cargo and potentially crew in the future to space station. And so they're very low Earth or oriented. Uh, for us, on a lunar, our lunar and a Mars kind of exploration, there'll be partnerships. It's really more about international partnerships where we'll have right now for Orion, we didn't talk a little about that, but Orion, we have partnerships with the European Space Agency and all the countries uh, in, that, uh, in Europe that provide the bottom half of the spacecraft. And so we're working with them already as a partnership for Orion. And I envision in the, uh, from NASA perspective that we would do that for future missions to Mars as well. So we have a complementary role between the commercial providers that are providing a taxi service to the space station, and then for exploration is really what uh, NASA is focused on. All right. Let's do, if you haven't asked a question yet, I, I don't think you have. All right, go for it. <laughs> All right, so he's asking about the Martian and how accurate was the science um, in, in the film. I think the, the book was uh, very well done. It, had a, it ca captured, I thought, a lot of the nuances of how um, NASA works, the bureaucracy, and <laughs> just the process of how things get done. I, I was really impressed with the le level of detail they put in the book about um, you know, how much we, he needed to grow in order to survive for however many days. I, you know, obviously, the, the video, the film was, you know, Hollywood, dramatic, <laughs> pretty <laughs> quite a bit. So you know, not as accurate. But I, I really, really enjoyed the book. I thought it was well done. Funny uh, story. Well, go ahead, if I go can, ahead. just yeah. the um, guy that I work with a lot on Mars stuff. Uh, one of our really good Mars scientists that's done a lot of work on the rover programs and things. Uh, saw Andy Weir at one of our conferences. And he just came up to me and he goes, you know, I loved your book and everything. The only thing that was wrong with it was the whole thing about the windstorm blowing the antenna into him could never happen because <laughs> it, Mars' atmosphere just isn't dense enough for that to really happen. <laughs> so other than the premise of the whole thing, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're actually out of time. Unfortunately, we don't have time for additional questions. But I'm going to let Peggy kind of impart some words of wisdom to our young audience members on kind of inspiring you to – to pursue your dreams and hopefully work at NASA. <laughs> well, we definitely want a lot of young people helping us to get on this next exploration mission. But what I want to tell all of you is that, you know, number one, you got to find what it is that, you know, inspires you and drives you, what you're passionate about, what, what, make, what sounds really, really fun to you. That, that's the most important thing. Find that, that thing. And then you have to work to make it happen. Because as much as we might like to have somebody hire us for our dream, dream job when we're nine years old, that doesn't usually happen. And it's going to take some work and effort. So taking those classes in school, um, you know, I, I was in biology and chemistry, but I had to take a lot of math classes, and it was hard for me. Uh, but I did it anyway. And you just got to keep trying and keep going, keep pushing. It took 10 years of me applying before I ever made it as an astronaut. So... Find the, find the passion, find the dream, and work really, really hard. 
and then challenge yourself to do more than you think you can. Because don't just take the easy way out and say, oh, that, that's too hard. I don't think I want to try and do that. that might, I might not be good at that. Challenge yourself. Do those things, and you'll find out you can live a life even more than you might dream of. That's awesome. All right, thank you guys so much. And thank you for being a great audience. Peggy is going to be here for a short amount of time to sign one. All right, Twitch Cat. How's it going? You may be wondering why we were uh, running the presentation there. It was just like, where are the streamers at, huh? <laughs> we are uh, actually here live at the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum, and uh, we had permission to stream that talk for NASA Orion with astronaut Peggy Whitson down there for the Intrepid Museum. Uh, just check, flip this back around so we can see how pretty we are. Let's see how this works. Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Like that? Oh man, look at that. Yeah, not so, uh, I mean, we're actually here, yep, live, here. at the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum. That's not just like, oh, it's a boring NASA feed or anything like that. Uh, I'm Dos Valdez, this is the channel that we're on. I've got EJ underscore SA with me here, and uh, we've been sitting up here running the stream equipment. We've got the laptop, we've been reading and talking in Twitch chat, uh, we've sent out tweets and stuff like that, we've got the nice camera and everything. Um, when we were switching back and forth to the presentation, that was us! Like, we're Twitch streamers! And uh, massive thanks to the Intrepid Museum for, for inviting us to come out here and uh, share this sort of content with you. The, the coolest thing is that this isn't all. We have another presentation but coming wait, up. There's more. Yeah, but wait, there's more, exactly. Yeah, but wait, there's more. Um, we actually have another presentation that's going to be starting at 2.30 p.m. Uh, it's going to be Peggy Whitson, the astronaut, the astronaut with the most uh, total U.S. time in space. 665 days, I think it was, right? And uh, that's going to start at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Tile Time Time here on my channel, twitch.tv slash Das Valdez. I'm thinking about now, shuttle tiles, huh? <laughs> just thinking about shuttle tiles, nice. Yeah, I got, I got tiles on the brain. Um, the other thing is, after that presentation, we're going to take Gun Run's mobile backpack, like the IRL backpack, and we're going to walk around the rest of the ship. So we have access to the flight deck, where there's like there's like 20 or 30 fighter planes and helicopters and stuff up there. Uh, we have access to the shuttle pavilion. Yesterday we streamed from the uh, from the tower, from the like conning tower of the conning tower superstructure. Yeah, we were up on the bridge. We were on the bridge of the carrier with uh, Gun Run's backpack. And uh, we were able to stream from up there. So we have all this awesome access to the museum. Uh, we also have a booth here. So we've got an interactive uh, Kerbal Space Academy booth. Where we've got computers that have Kerbal Space program running. It's back in Hangar Deck 3. If you're watching us in the rest of the museum, they're actually piping this stream to monitors throughout the rest of the museum as well. Yep. So uh, <laughs> if you're here, if you're, if you're in New York, um, that other presentation is going to be at 2.30. We'll also be streaming it here on my channel. Um, stay with us. We are going to shut the stream down for now. Uh, and uh, we do have, we're gonna get some lunch, I think, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Let's get a little lunch. Um, and we'll go back and check out the booth and stuff like that. We've, we've got laptops and Xbox uh, with Kerbal Space Program Enhanced Edition where kids can sit down and play the game. We've got instructors. I know my, my, my buddy Sarian back there holding it down at the booth while we came up to do the broadcast. Um, again, again, massive thanks to uh, Intrepid for inviting us to come out here. It's been pretty awesome. It's been so awesome. Dude, what do you think? We, EJ walked around the shuttle for, uh, well, like an hour. More than I probably should have. We went inside the airplane restoration hangar. Oh yeah, that was that was very cool. We got to talk to with the mechanics uh, who actually work on restoring the artifacts, restoring the planes and stuff oh, like yeah. that. Um, so all of those streams, we've got the vods up on our channel. You can go back and you can watch stuff from the previous days. In fact, it might be cool to like, I don't know, fire up a videos. I don't know. We'll see what we can do. Um, but that's on my channel, this channel you're watching right now, and it's on EJ's channel. Mod, see if you can get a link for EJ over there. Uh, again, Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum, it's an aircraft carrier in New York City that's been converted into a museum ship. It's got a space shuttle on it, and it's got tons of other cool stuff. They've got an event going on right now that's Kids Week 2018, and uh, we as Twitch streamers, trying to use Twitch as our educational outreach thing, we're out here sharing that with, with y'all and, and everybody else. Yes, yeah, science. S sci yeah, science. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and shut it down now. We do appreciate y'all hanging out with us. Um, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Next time, we're going to see if we can actually take some questions from Twitch chat. 
So we'll go talk down with the moderator, and we'll say, hey, if we raise our hand, could we be like, oh, question from Twitch chat, you know, let's, what are we going to do to go to Mars or whatever? Um, we'll see if we can set that up next time. I mean, so. to be fair, the kids' questions is the actually kids questions pretty good. The kids' questions great. They were pretty good. I like it. I liked in, in the presenters did such a good job uh, interacting oh, yeah. with the kids. It's not just like, and oh, now there is time. You know, it, it's, yeah, it's it really good. cool to see that. And the kids all like yelling out the answers and stuff. There's a time to raise your hand and be polite. And there's a time to just scream because ah. you're really excited about something. You know what I mean? I mean we, we know about screaming when we're excited about something. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. There's the bridge tour vod right there. Mr. Drummer, thank you for putting that in chat. Wait, when will we come back? Uh, about an hour and a half, Alexis. The, the, the presentation starts about an hour and a half from now. We'll be back live a little bit before then and sort of like hang out with you all, make sure we do the audio checks and everything. Um, I do appreciate... Everybody hanging out with us again. Thanks to Twitch as well. Twitch, Twitch helping us get the word out a little bit. Um, but I'm Das Valdez, Twitch streamer full time. Uh, EJ underscore SA, my buddy here, also Twitch streamer full time. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and shut this stream down for now, and we will be back shortly before 2:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. About an hour and a half from now. About an hour and a half from now. So uh, I wouldn't have an away screen. Y'all just pretend like this screen says says like thanks we'll be, for we'll watching. Thank you for watching. Yeah, wait. You guys, hey, wait, I got this. Look, thanks for watching. Nice. <laughs> there. Nice. All, right, all right, cool. This is, thanks for watching. Yep. Not exactly we'll be back, guys. Does. All right, let's put it over We got here. more. That looks good. I like it. All right. MLG Pro Twitch streamers here. Yeah, we're, we're really good at what we do. <laughs> we'll see you all next time. Later, nerds. See you guys. Thank you.